Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining in today. Let me give a few minutes here for the room to populate. I'm going to say hello in the chat box. If anybody doesn't mind just saying hello back, make sure we're broadcasting. Thank you for sharing your uh, mid afternoon with us. Um, we are fortunate to have Leonard with us and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. In the meantime, we have a little zoom uh, housekeeping for you. Uh, please uh, feel uh, welcome and we encourage questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the chat box of the Q&A and uh, we're, we'll definitely get to as many as possible. Um, as usual, ask anything that you care to uh, ask in that chat box of the Q&A and we'll be sure to get to it. Um, the uh, webinar today is being recorded. And so if there's something that you miss or come in late or care to share it with another that might benefit from hearing about beach real estate, um, please feel free to share it with them. It'll be on the YouTube channel in about a day uh, for Family Office Insights YouTube channel. Big, big thank you to everybody who has uh, been a huge contributor to Family Office Insights and participated regularly as well as contributing to great companies that get to present in this format and shifting from us meeting. And, and of course, I miss you all um, in New York City in Midtown Conference Room. And uh, we will be doing that again soon, I hope. Uh, I know that's an optimistic view, but uh, I tend to be an optimist. So uh, in, in the meantime, we're doing two or three of these a week and um, we've enjoyed uh, having you and, and your participation in Family Office Insights and all the speakers that have contributed. It's been super great. You guys have been awesome. Um, so again, we're recording this for the record. We can't see or hear you, but we can see you in, in the chat box. Please, again, uh, ask away as we move along here. And with that, I'm going to welcome Leonard, who is uh, kindly um, sp spending an hour with us and telling us about uh, the history and the opportunity to in invest with Beach Real Estate. Leonard, welcome. Thank you, Arthur. Much appreciated. Uh, so all, if you will, I'm going to get my screen going here for you. And uh, tell you a little bit about what Beach Real Estate Funds is, is doing and where all we can hopefully take you. So with that, hopefully you're seeing a nice screen that says Beach Real Estate Funds. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so what are we about? We, we, the Beach Real Estate Funds is a subsidiary of the Beach Company. Beach Company is a 75-year-old real estate company that was founded and has been headquartered in Charleston, South Carolina for its whole time. Uh, we are a family-owned firm, uh, now on to the fifth generation. Uh, the third generation and, and a couple of the members out of the fourth generation are in the management of the company itself. Uh, it, but while we are a family owned company, we have really tried to institutionalize ourselves as, as much as possible uh, outside board of directors and the like. Um, you know, you don't make, make it 75 years um, without having some good practices in place. But what is the, uh, what is it I'm presenting to you today? So uh, my opportunity is the Beach Real Estate in, uh, Beach Investment Fund, sorry. Um, we're managed through the Beach Real Estate Funds, LLC. Uh, what do we do? We're buying apartments throughout the Southeast, uh, existing properties with the goal of <clears throat> creating value at those properties wherever we can in, in a different sort of means. You might be familiar with the concept of value add, wherein you go in and renovate the properties, particularly the insides of the units, make a nice kitchen and nicer uh, bathrooms and the like. Uh, that's predominantly what we do, but we also love to tackle the amenity package and everything else. So you create value by giving the renter something more than they had before. They're generally uh, willing to help pay for those improvements through increased rents and the increased rents then results in increased value. Of course, a relatively simple formula. 
in uh, on paper, uh, much harder to execute in reality. So a brief uh, summary here of, of the fund. Again, we're investing in multifamily property throughout the Southeast with a primary concentration on the Carolinas and Georgia, uh, Northern Florida and parts of uh, Northern Alabama. What we're offering our investors is a 8% cumulative preferred return uh, and a 13 to 15% uh, deal level IRR. We're targeting a $75 million raise and we have crossed the 50% mark uh, last month. So we're quite happy to be in the process of uh, continuing this raise. The fund is for seven years. So we started uh, officially the summer of 19. So we're now a year and a half in, but we have the ability to extend uh, if market cycles uh, dictate. And then the beach company has uh, committed 10%. So seven and a half million to the overall deal. And then between um, affiliated companies and principals and family members, we are over a $12 million commitment to the $75 million target. Leonard, if you don't mind, it's, uh, I know this question is gonna come up and since you were talking about it now, what's the, the investors who have committed so far look like? You don't have to tell us who they are. Sure. But what's, what, what do they look like in terms of you know, the profile aside from the, the principles of the firm? Uh, about a third of our investors are family offices. The uh, other third making a, a major third, really 50% are high net worth individuals. Uh, we've got a couple of institutional level groups that have come in uh, uh, rounding out uh, the raise so far. So by and large, we have just over 30 investors at the moment uh, of that mix. The, the vast majority are high net worth individuals um, who have a, a fair number have invested with us over many years and, and know our track record and are quite happy. Uh, the family offices that have come in, uh, our largest investor is at 5 million and we go down to uh, half million. So we're running the gamut there. Um, tend to be agnostic as to how much any one group puts in. We want to make everybody happy and if half a million makes you happy, great. If five million makes you happy, even better. Uh, really love to talk to somebody at the 50 million mark. That would make my life really, really happy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a quick summary, you know, what, what is it we're really doing here? Uh, I mentioned it, but let, let me just step you through the process a bit. We're, we're utilizing your money if you choose to invest with us the, and we're gonna buy existing properties. Why existing? Well, they're already making money. They're, you get cash flow day one. Great, great problem to have. Hopefully we would uh, raise our total target and that would bring us to eight to 10 properties overall. About a $250 million acquisition. Uh, the Beach Company, as I said, has been around for 75 years. We have been in every form of real estate uh, there is. We have fully integrated systems for the asset management, the property management, the financing, the construction. Uh, there isn't a part of multifamily property that we don't know. It, it is the strength and, and the main core of what the Beach Company does. Um, Prior to this fund and, and today, the company is predominantly a development company. So if we can do development, which is far more complex and uh, lengthy in time, then we feel that the acquisition and management of properties fits nicely into the wheelhouse of everything else. Uh, going there to step four, again, what we're talking about in terms of creating value, well, we're gonna reposition those properties. What do I mean by that? Well. I'm going to use a property that we're about to acquire uh, here in the just outside of Charleston, where we're headquartered. We're closing on it next week. It's a property where the average rental rates are roughly a thousand dollars a unit. The market is twelve hundred dollars a unit. Why is it less? Well, the only reason is that the current owners didn't choose to push the rents any higher, um, or they didn't choose to push them high enough. This property will get all new interiors, get a new amenity package, uh, new fitness, new pool, 
new uh, dog parks and grilling stations and bring a whole new lease on life to the uh, property that was built in 1980. For all that, uh, we feel that if people are willing to spend $1,200 in that market, then they'll probably be willing to spend $1,200 at our property if we make our property nicer to compete with the other properties in, in the area. <clears throat> so that's the main gist of the, uh, of the program. And then when we do all of this, we get to take advantage of all the great tax codes. So uh, between cost segregation up front, which I'll touch on in a little bit, and uh, writing off the value of everything that's taken out and then accelerating the depreciation on everything that's brought in. So if you think about it, every time you replace a washing machine or a refrigerator, you get to write off the old and, and accelerate the depreciation on the new. That helps to drive a uh, generally a tax loss while being cash flow positive. So it's a win-win situation there. And then at the end of the day, all of these factors come together and uh, as rents have increased and expenses have been um, streamlined, thus the overall property becomes more valuable. And when we go to sell it, you'll uh, realize that healthy return. Uh, we do all of this um, by implementing a clear discernible strategy. As I said, the company's been doing this for 75 years. I personally have been with the company 22 years. I've seen the cycles, I've seen the recessions, and I've seen the best of times. So uh, the beauty about multifamily is, you know, we can adjust relatively quickly to what's going on. So what is it we're looking to buy? Um, just a quick summary here again, multifamily properties that show upside potential, that are in really good areas that have commerce driving uh, the markets there. So for example, right now we've been concentrating a lot on the Atlanta and the Raleigh, Atlanta, Georgia and the Raleigh, North Carolina markets, very diverse economies, lots of job growth and economic growth, uh, despite even the COVID, um, it, it, there's jobs, jobs, jobs everywhere throughout these areas. Um, yes, they took their hits with COVID, but the jobs are coming back quickly. And we believe that overall COVID is more of a blip on the radar screen to our ownership period than a, a major detriment. We also look for areas that have uh, some pretty significant barriers to entry, making it harder for new product to come online. That's uh, that older property type that we focus on um, can stay uh, fully rented and leased. Generally try to have at least 150 units and we prefer that uh, garden style product that we're all familiar with, uh, two to three stories tall, spread out over a number of acres with surface parking. All right, so again, just a recap of our key terms, raising 75 million with the IRR goal of 13 to 15% and an 8% uh, prefer returns to our investors. Um, 20% promote to the general partner after that 8% is met. And then the only fee to the fund is uh, at 1.5% of the capital committed. So I've touched on a little bit of this as we've been going through here, but why, why multifamily in today's market? Um, well, I think we could all agree that the retail market is a bit um, in distress and too many movers. So if the retail's at one end of the spectrum, we view the multifamily at the other end. It is a very solid, very stable marketplace, uh, primarily because it's housing and everyone has to have their housing. But what is driving that housing? Um, it's household formations. So every, I think the easiest way to think of this, every time uh, a student leaves college to graduate and goes on their own and then moves out from being under mom and dad's roof, that is a new household. So households are being formed every day and there is not enough supply, not enough new product being built, either in the form of apartments or new homes, uh, single family homes. And even if they are being built, uh, there are price points that 
generally far exceed what the vast majority of the population can afford. Uh, there also renting is generally cheaper than buying a home. And then there's just cultural shifts that people prefer to rent now versus the, uh, the old goal of owning and uh, owning that property forever. And, that, and that's a generational shift that is covering all the generations. So the baby boomers down to the uh, Gen Z uh, across are choosing to rent for the long term versus buying. Uh, Again, why multifamily over other real estate types? Um, they all have their pros and their cons, but we believe in general multifamily is a, is a more resilient property type. And it's something that we know the best of, but you're gonna get greater, the greatest uh, cash flow stability, uh, quickly can adjust to inflation and uh, we can adapt to the changing marketplace as quickly as, much more quickly than say an office building where all the tenants were on 10 year leases. Uh, again, why, do, why are we looking to existing properties versus a brand new development? There's nothing wrong with brand new development. As I said, our company has been doing it for decades, um, but they have a long lead time. Uh, your idea today might be four to five years before the first residents move in. Uh, that's a long time to have your money sit uh, while the construction and everything else goes. The beauty of an existing property, you're cash flowing day one. Uh, the existing properties also generally are in really good locations, great accessibility and larger units than, than what you'll find in newer product. They've got a proven stability in uh, drivers to them. And generally they need a little something to just make them that little bit more appealing. The vast majority of the renting population out there, and this is nationwide, really just wants a nice clean place to live, feel safe uh, in their house. You know, a unit is a unit is a unit at the end of the day. The utility of the apartment is the same, whether it rents for $1,000 or it rents for $3,000. The rest is all um, ego, if you will. People want nice things and they pay for nice things if, if they can afford it. We cater to a market that wants something a little bit nicer, but can't necessarily afford the nicest and the newest. So the Southeast, well, it's the market we know the best and thank goodness for that fact, but the Southeast is, has been really the bright spot for the, uh, the whole United States. Um, the other parts of the country are great and well and good, but once you get away from their primary markets, they're not doing quite as well as the Southeast overall. Um, this region of the country outperforms the rest of the, of the US in terms of growth for population, wage and jobs. Um, doesn't have the amount of rent controls and political limitations that can affect your ability to increase rents and manage a property the way you see it should be. Uh, and of course, the Southeast has been just a preferred area to live in. The, the demographics here are proving it out. People have been moving to the Southeast consistently for the last decade plus. Um, if anything, COVID has accelerated the amount of people moving into the South on a permanent basis. And of course, just, you know, it, it take in case the weather and everything and all the other economic drivers and the, the overall market just all congeals around this, this fact and uh, it's been a great for the multifamily world. So a few quick slides here, just showing you a few of the drivers here. I talked about household formation. So that top line there, this was done, uh, this study there was done by John Burns, real estate consultant, and it was uh, completed in 2018, but it was a study through 2025 for household formations. And fully 24% of the households to be formed over this time period are gonna be in the Southeast. And then uh, the vast majority of the households are expected to be renters. 
So across the board, as you look at these numbers, it's roughly 60% are expected to be renters. Uh, and on average, uh, across the country, 37% of households rent the rest own the property. So here's a very telling thing. You're going to have a lot of households and they're also expected to be renters as well. Um, housing population continues to uh, the, the stock, housing stock. You can see here the solid lines uh, took the dip through 2010 and have been coming back up since in terms of new housing, housing being built, both a single family and multifamily. Um, when then you watch that dotted line there, the it's just in the last few recent years that the overall number of uh, housing starts has started to catch up to the amount of households. But again, what is being built is far too expensive for the vast majority of the population and those new households that are being formed. Some other drivers I mentioned earlier, it's generally cheaper to rent than to own. So here's a quick uh, little summary of some of the major markets throughout the Southeast and some of the uh, cost differentiators. I'll take Atlanta, dead center. Uh, the, this is measuring the cumulative percentage increase in the cost to own versus the cost to rent for the past three years. So in Atlanta, the cost of owning was 33% greater uh, it increased 33% versus the cost to rent was had grown 19%. Uh, let's take Jacksonville, Florida again, 34.8% increase in the cost of owning versus a 13% cost of renting increases. So for a lot of people, particularly uh, the millennials and the, and the Gen Zers behind them, struggling with student debts and, uh, and and other loads, uh, lifestyle changes, it behooves them to continue renting versus trying to own. One, one would deduce from those stats that there's also room for, <clears throat> independent of the other factors, what people can afford for increases to, to continue for renting. S since there's a big a delta between the, the the how much it's cost to own as opposed to it's it's cost to rent. I know there's other factors, but um, the uh, would you say that that gives you room to raise rents even more? Uh, absolutely, yes. The you know the national average is, uh, in particularly for for the housing um, administration is. They, they feel that if your housing costs are greater than 30% of household income, then you are housing burdened, if you will. So what we look for primarily in our properties is, does the average rent fall in below that 30% marker? Easy way to think about this. If it's $1,000 a month in rent, that's $12,000 a year at a third, you can make up to $36,000. If you're making $36,000, then you should be able to afford the thousand month in rent. If we do our study of that market for the property that we're currently looking at and the average household income is say $45,000. When now you have a, a you know, what is it, a $9,000 gap. So if you're paying $1,000 now, you, as a percentage of 45,000, it's much less than as a percentage of 36,000. So right. what that tells us is, yes, we have the ability to increase rents up uh, because the, the wages are higher. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, there's always going to be supply and demand and, you know, we don't want to overshoot that, that level too quickly. Um, but it is a, a number that we're highly cognizant of. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're probably going to get to it, but the stats that you went to uh, talked about earlier, one would also think that the sellers know that things are changing and there's a demand. So you still have to buy things right. And um, you're probably going to talk about that, but you know, is there enough inventory to buy at a cap rate that makes sense? 
Yes, yeah, so, well, I can segue to that right now. Um, there's always inventory to be bought. Um, somebody is always wanting to sell and somebody's always wanting to buy. And thank goodness that that's what keeps real estate world uh, thriving. Um, this past year, yes, the market came to a screeching halt in April and May. And by August, uh, properties were being brought back out to market. Um, and we're very fortunate to be playing in that. As I mentioned earlier, we're buying a property uh, closing this month. It came to market at the end of September. And, you know, there are always drivers there. The sellers are absolutely cognizant of, of where their property sits within the overall market. And um, they will do their best to extract the best price that they can for it. And it's incumbent upon us to look at what we're buying and what we can do to that property and make our offer uh, contingent upon our, our underwriting there. So uh, we don't talk cap rates too, too much. They're, they're a bit ambiguous in, in unless you know how they're, everything's calculated. It's, it's just a point in time reference as to what all the points are. We look at the holistic underwriting of a property, what's within our control and what isn't, and we go from there. Uh, stepping back quickly to drivers, just a few things that help drive um, the, the overall expectations of, of uh, demand for multifamily units. Uh, national studies, uh, this one's a compilation of, of Yardi Matrix, one of the largest multifamily tracking groups in the country, the Census Bureau of Muties Analytics. Uh, they're expecting a demand for multifamily of over 425,000 units a year. We're not developing anywhere close to that. Um, some of the latest stats pre-COVID were we were on track for 330,000 units. Now that's nationwide, but that also tends to be in the largest cities in the most, uh, most expensive areas. And also uh, a unit that's renting for say $2,000 a month for a Two bedroom unit where some of the older properties we deal with, two bedroom units rents for 1200. So you have a price differential. But what makes up some of these drivers? Uh, of course, age, as I talked about, you have new renters coming in out of the uh, college ranks, uh, divorce, hate to say it, but it happens. And we see it every year in January. There's always a little spike at every one of our properties, first or second week of January. And then, um, you know, you've got people who have uh, not been able to get out and been living at home, and now they're finally getting out in their mid-20s and whatnot. Of course, lifestyle changes. So let me briefly mention uh, some of the impacts of COVID, and I, I think it's important that we, we bring up speed here. Um, totally cognizant that the that the that it's out there and uh, we're still suffering through a prolonged period, but uh, by and large, it is not um, ruling the day, if you will. Life does go on. Um, I know our audience is from all over the US, if not the world at the moment. Uh, I will tell you in the Southeast, generally life has, is moving on. Um, so everything that was happening pre-COVID is still happening. People are still migrating into the area. Jobs are still being created in the area. Um, and so our long-term demographic drivers are still in play. And we, can, we expect them to continue to be in play for many years to come. Uh, the properties that we own uh, have performed well. And despite it, we have gotten rent increases um, as tenants renew and new tenants come in. Uh, basically, we don't see COVID as uh, having a major long-term impact other than a beneficial impact of driving more people to the Southeast. So value creation, how do we make a return for you as the investor? <clears throat> I talked briefly about this before, but touch on a few things. One, it comes down to buying the right property. And what do you do with that property? Um, 
that the real value is created through how a property is managed. Um, we never underestimate the impact of asset management. There's, there's property management that's great, but it's the asset management, that level that's constantly looking at the property and saying, what could I, what can we do to make it a little bit better, a little bit better, keep going here. So first we have to find the right property, handle that through the acquisition side, uh, great strategic locations, strong sub markets within markets that are already stronger. Many of those trends I talked to you about previously. Now, once you own the property, what is it you're gonna do? Shall it be renovating the units, creating some more units? Uh, there are plenty of properties out there that have some extra land, maybe a phase two that never got built. That would fit right inside the beach company's wheelhouse. We could bring our whole development team uh, to bear to uh, add another third or 50% to a property. In which case you've already owned the land and you own the amenity structure, the cost of the units are become uh, much more affordable than trying to build a brand new product um, to compete. Uh, we also look for the opportunistic purchases in, in the mismanaged communities. You think, how could that be in this day and age? Well, they still are. Uh, there are always properties that just aren't being managed to their fullest and that are being managed in a uh, less than modern way, if you will. So there's always ways to uh, extract and create some value, shave costs, uh, increased rents. Um, we allow for each property to speak for itself. We don't try to come in from a cookie cutter approach and say, well, we've done it before, so this is what we're gonna do again. Uh, we like to let each property speak. We figure out the best strategy for it. And we go and apply that strategy. And if done correctly, the rents follow. And as rents increase, then the return on investment increases and overall value of the property increases for the, for the investors. I wanted to briefly touch on one item I mentioned earlier that's often overlooked, but through one of the true benefits of private investing, and that is uh, the cost or the value retention through you know, income tax deferment. So what is allowed through our tax codes is uh, cost segregation. And what is cost segregation? Well, cost segregation is taking the cost of the, of the property that you're buying in and bifurcating those costs into different little buckets that the IRS allows you to depreciate over different periods of time. So I'm gonna switch down to this little goal and I'm sorry if, if, it's, if it's small and not everyone can see it. But here, uh, I, we used our first property we ever bought. So I'm just going to circle here. The property was $19 million to purchase. And the accountants believe that uh, 2.9 million of that 19 million was in the land and just over 16 million was in the building. All right. So if you're familiar with depreciation, uh, in our case, through the new tax laws, it's a 30 year depreciable term. So you take 16 million divide by 30 and you can have depreciation each year, 535,000. That's well and good. However, through cost segregation, the accountants and engineers determined, well, there's a little over 3 million that can be depreciated over a five year period. And a little bit that can go over seven and about a million two fifty that can be depreciated over 15 years. So you can see here that $535,000 of standard depreciation has now grown to a million ninety one thousand for the first five years. Since we've doubled the amount of depreciation that can be taken on this property. So what is the impact? This first grid here shows our expected uh, net operating income less the debt service. So think about net cash flow less the depreciation on a cumulative basis. So under the standard over our seven year hold, we would have recognized 
a million two of income for, for this property. Through using cost segregation and accelerating that depreciation forward, you can see that over the seven year hold, the uh, cumulative would have been a loss of a million four. So in this particular case, as we send out our K-1s to our investors, we're sending out a loss. It has nothing to do with cash flow. The cash is always positive. These properties are producing. So, but there's a, always a disconnect between cash that you receive and the taxes that you pay. Uh, other than that, I have your standard disclaimer. Please talk to your accountant about anything specific to you and your taxes uh, situation. But in general, this is this is how it applies and how we flow through to the K-1s for our investors. So, Leonard, I have to tell you that so often I've um, seen folks who are uh, intentionally uh, wanting to invest in funds of real estate and they get befuddled by the goodies that may or may not pass through. And this was an excellent explanation of how the cost segregation works, carving out certain parts of the, of the asset that can be accelerated in depreciation because people have talked about depreciation and cost seg, but this was a very good explanation about it. And I have to admit that I understand it pretty intimately um, and there's nuances, but this is a very good straightforward. And what you said is absolutely um, uh, uh, music to one's ears in that you've got current income, but you have, can offset it depending on your tax situation with uh, a loss, which gives you positive cash flow, right? Yeah. So it, it, super cool. Nicely done. I, I will state um, from a, as, as a real estate professional, we don't make acquisitions we don't make our purchases based on you know the tax loss that we can generate we want that we we concentrate solely on cash flow and can we generate the cash flow that will give our investors their returns and that makes the projects work uh, what i have found though is that if the cash flow is going in the right direction and it is allowing us to make the returns that we want then the tax loss component flows right along with it and you get all the benefits here that you can over the long term. So um, you know, we, don't, we don't make our decisions based on the tax losses, uh, but they are quite beneficial. So I wanted to show you the properties that we have currently purchased uh, briefly here. We have purchased three properties. Our first was the reserve at Sweetwater Creek. This is in Austell, Georgia, uh, directly west of Atlanta, just outside the perimeter and directly north of I-20. Smaller property at 156 units. Um, the prior owner <coughs> had uh, come through and had reskinned the whole property, um, getting rid of vinyl and some old T-111 cedar siding for Hardy Plank, uh, gave it a whole new look and feel and we have come through and have been renovating units so at the end of the day our plan is to renovate 120 units of the 156 and you can see in this picture here uh, what it looks like so we'll use the existing cabinets uh, give them a fresh coat of paint new hardware a whole new look and lease on light coming in with granite countertops full tile backsplashes and stainless steel appliances. New flooring throughout. Uh, and I really wish I had a picture here. We were changing out the old sliding aluminum doors that are always binding up and never work quite right with uh, nice sets of French doors that have little mini blinds built into them. It's just a nice crisp look. Uh, again, go back to what I said at the beginning. The utility of the unit has not changed at all, but the look and the feel and the, and the desirability of being there is so much greater. Uh, down at the bottom, you see here a little sports court. This was a 
the tennis court that had high fencing and course wasn't being used because very few people played tennis anymore and it looked it was an eyesore. Um, this was our first one and I'll show you some other examples but we took that tennis court resurfaced it the front half is a little bit of a crossfit workout area for the older clientele and as you go past that little sunshade shed uh, on the ground is painted out hopscotch and other games for the kids. So we made uh, this multi-purpose area. And then on the back right corner, you can see we added a dog park. So every member of the family can get out and have a little recreation at the same time. Uh, I mentioned that we're only gonna renovate 120 units here. And why is that? Why wouldn't I go do all 156? Well. One, uh, we, the, as the old adage is, leave a little meat on the bone for the next guy. Since we know we'll be selling, uh, we want the next buyer to have something to do to create some value as well. But more importantly, the main reason is if we pro forma to renovate all 156 units, then we would fool ourselves into paying a higher price for this property because we would be generating greater cash flow. With each renovation, you get a higher rent than you would have before. Uh, so we always uh, keep our unit renovations at around 66% to 70% of the total property. Uh, in this case, we're spending a, right at a $10,000 a unit to make all the renovations and change the flooring and the bathrooms and the French doors, as I mentioned. Um, and then we're getting in return approximately $200, $225 a month in increased rent. So that's a return on investment in the 20, low 20% range, which is a nice sweet spot for us. And we're very happy with that number. Again, we purchased this property for 19 million. We used uh, Freddie Mac debt and uh, our projected uh, return on equity and our hold when we purchased this in June 19, we're 8.67% and 14%. I'm happy to say that uh, we're lucky, rather lucky than good. Uh, we have floating rate debt. And so we are saving 30 plus thousand dollars a month in interest expense right now um, due to the change in the debt markets. And our return on equity is uh, tapping just over 10% here. Our second and third properties are Amberwood, Lockmere, and Bennington Woods, but we treat them as one. So Amberwood was built <coughs> in uh, the mid, uh, what was it, 91? And Bennington was built immediately next door to it in 96 by the same developer. He had already sold off Amberwood when he built uh, Bennington. As we were buying Amberwood, we came to find out that Bennington could be purchased as well. And so we set about getting that done as an off-market transaction. A couple of great things here. You take a 206 unit property and you immediately grow it. So now we have uh, another 134 units, nicely renovated property. So the, of the 134 units, we got about 125 that were fully renovated. That right there took care of the renovation program for the first year. We went about combining the two properties. And as we end uh, our first year of full ownership for both, we're well on our way. We have been um, renovating all the exteriors, all new paint job, uh, new railings, and the pool area at Amberwood has been refreshed with greater amount of decking and, and surface uh, changes. We took a tennis court area here and took the tennis court out completely, made it a grass field, added a couple of grilling stations to it and made it a real amenity where you can get out and enjoy some time with your family and your friends. Uh, taking the existing dog parks and, and improve them. Uh, right now we're in the, in the final throes of going through what was the leasing and clubhouse building for Amberwood and giving it its uh, first renovation in probably 20 years. 
and it will uh, be the main leasing office for the property. So we're taking the, the what was the leasing office for Bennington Woods and that property, that process just started and we're turning it into a full on clubhouse um, <clears throat> slash co-working facility. So uh, as people are still continuing to work from home, they will have a, a building that they can go to that's key fob control and be able to stretch your legs and give them a little bit different environment to, to get their work done there. Um, different approach to the properties. As I said, we like to let each one think um, and present their own strategy. <coughs> uh, you can see some of the um, financial summary at the bottom and how uh, combining these two properties was quite uh, beneficial. We believe that we have achieved over a $300,000 a year uh, expense savings through just combining the two properties when compared to the prior two owners and their expense load. Again, happy to report I can see the state well um, within uh, acceptable limits and rank growth has been existing as well. All right. Just wrap up very quickly a bit on the beach company itself. You heard me say it, uh, we're a 70, 75 year old company. We were founded back in 1945 by JC Long when he bought what is the Isle of Palms. So if you've ever been to the area, it's a barrier island um, resort getaway uh, portion of Charleston. Uh, thanks to his foresight, it's now uh, a fully uh, integrated uh, community of its own. But in our company's history, we have uh, touched pretty much every real estate type there is and has developed, uh, we have developed uh, well over a billion and a half of product. And in the last decade alone have been heavily focused on the multifamily world um, and currently have a pipeline several hundred million of apartments at any given time. We've uh, been privately owned the entire time, as I had mentioned, and have been pleased to have been ranked as one of the top 40 private companies in South Carolina. And we guide our, our decision-making for what is best for the long-term uh, and not just the short buck. Um, our motto within the company is, you know, um, one uh, one thoughtful place at a, you know, improving the world, one thoughtful place at a time. So I should stumble over my own motto. But, uh, we are very Totally much, cool. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very much focused on managing our properties and managing through processes uh, versus just uh, trying to make the quick flip. So... And I think that is it. Oh, if, if you want, we've got a full accompaniment of, uh, of, of our leadership. Uh, I am pleased to, to stay. We, we're a very well and long tenured company um, of the individuals you see here who make up uh, of the vast majority of our management leadership. Uh, our, our average tenure is over 15 years with the company. So our CEO, John Darby, has been with the company over 30 years. Uh, we recently had uh, our former chief financial officer retire. He had been with the company for 26 years uh, as well. We also just had our <clears throat> controller uh, retire after a stint of 27 years. So. Um, we had two individuals retire this year who had been with the company for 50 and 51 years. So we're very pleased with those stats and, you know, nothing against the new folks, but they're bringing our numbers down. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. That's great. Go ahead. Continue. No, that's, that's really it. Uh, just, just in a nutshell, you know, I guess the question would be why would you invest with the beach company when there's so many other operators out there? I'm doing pretty much the same thing. Uh, sometimes we used to laugh. It's like anybody with a checkbook can buy an apartment community. And sometimes that's, that is in fact the truth, but 
buying something is, is not necessarily owning something and you have to create value. Um, I, I think there's too much emphasis this day today on syndications and everybody's going to be a buyer and they're syndicating and trying to bring in as much uh, LP money as they can. The real question is, well, what experience does that syndicator really bring to bear? What do they know? What, what are they doing? And we bring over our 75 year history, a great deal to bear what we do and how we go about doing it. Very good. Well done, Larry. What can you say about, uh, so this will be the first committed fund for the beach companies, right? Uh, it is the first uh, commingled fund for the company, yes. But it is not our first foray into uh, equity raising. For our development side, we have been, uh, <clears throat> we've always had partners um, in over the last 10 years, we raised approximately 350 million for those developments. Um, so this is just a different strategy and a different uh, approach for us, but not terribly outside of our wheelhouse. And the existing inventory of multifamily ownership prior to the fund, the beach companies own things presently that aren't going to be in the fund? Correct. We, we have a legacy portfolio of multifamily and retail and office, um, all of which will stay with in that, that legacy portfolio. We're not trying to co-mingle anything. Gotcha. And uh, Jim has a question, the minimum investment and what's the uh, penalty for liquidation prior to seven years? Um, the minimum investment has been a half million dollars. And the um, penalty for early liquidation is whether they're Unfortunately, not the early liquidation process built in. Uh, you can find somebody to buy your own share help. out, or we would have helped to accommodate that, but um, it is your standard fund. So once yep. you make the commitment, you're in. Yep. And if someone buys it, they buy it for whatever the market will bear your interest. That's all, right? Thank you for your question, Jim. Um, so if one were to uh, like to go to the next step and look under the hood a little bit, uh, Leonard, what would you suggest that they do? And uh, knowing that we're, we're gonna give you all the information of the people who are on the call here today. Absolutely. We do have a website dedicated to this fund at www.beachrealestatefunds.com. And there you'll get a summary of, of these materials and you'll have the ability to download this pitch book as well. And by doing so, your information will come to us and we'll reach right back out to you to get the conversation started. By all means, you can also email me directly. I've got my email address in my, in my title there. In case you can't see it all, it's lway at thebeachcompany.com. Yeah, we're going to make sure we put everything in touch as well. Great. Super well done. Thank you for hanging in there. You guys couldn't tell, but Leonard was, is on the mend and he doesn't have COVID. So, no, I don't. <laughs> so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining in today and your questions. And, uh, We'll, uh, as I said, make sure that everybody gets in touch with the, each other, put the recording up on the Family Office Insights YouTube channel, and uh, welcome uh, you or anybody else that you think might benefit from having a chat with Leonard. And um, Leonard, thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, as I always say, um, the uh, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Please reach out with any questions. Be happy to answer them and get dialogue started. Great. Happy to see you all. Everybody says thank you on the on the call too. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you.